Good day, Connie. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. I am so happy that you invited me. Thank you. Well, I've been meaning to do this for a long time, but I, so I'm kind of catching up to my backlog of people, and I'm so glad you agreed to do this. I have a series of questions to begin to introduce you to our audience, and let's start with, could you please introduce yourself and give us your name and tell us uh, where you grew up? Sure. Uh, the name's Connie Malamed, and my last name always gets mispronounced. That's fine. And I grew up in Philadelphia. Oh, very good. And so uh, where did you end up going to school and what did you study? Mm. Uh, as undergrad, I studied art and art education and graduate school was instructional design and technology. I went to a few uh, schools, uh, Temple University, Penn State and University of Texas, Austin. Well, that's a that's <laughs> that's a spread there from uh, Pennsylvania to Texas, um, and so where do you live now, and what do you do? Hmm. I live in the Maryland area, not too far from D.C. and Baltimore, and for a long time I worked as a consultant in the field of learning design. I guess you could call it. It changes every few years. And now, uh, several years ago, I opened a community to teach people uh, who needed help with instructional design. And I spent a lot of time working in the community, too. Well, very good. Um, so tell us a little bit about your journey from college uh, to the present day. You know, did you, did, what kinds of jobs did you have? What was your career progression? Were there any really interesting projects that you got a chance to work on? Mm. Well, for a long time, I was not really interested in a career. So I did uh, cabinet making. I can't say that my cabinets were square, but I built them. Uh, landscaping. I'm living in a very large intentional community in Tennessee. Just a lot of different things, a lot of travel. And then um, when that third kid came around, I just said, you know, I got to get a career here. This is getting too expensive. So I had done some contract work for publishers in instructional design. Um, we didn't call it that, but it was like making little kids workbooks. And I just thought it was so much fun. I kept wondering, is there such a thing as a career in this? And uh, I got a job at a computer lab in Austin. And during the first interview, I didn't have the job yet. Uh, my soon-to-be boss said to me, I'm getting my PhD in instructional design. And that was the first time I ever heard those words. And I nearly fell off my chair because I knew exactly what she meant, as opposed to most people think you're talking about interior design. Um, they say, can you come do my living room? So anyway, uh, I knew what she meant, and I immediately applied to the program. And when I was accepted, she made me take notes for her because we ended up having similar, you know, similar classes while she cut class. So uh, that's how I started getting into it. So you not only had to learn things, you had to teach others? <laughs> I guess, so. or take good notes, not <laughs> just, just scribbles and drawings. Well, it was self-paced instruction then for your right. Uh, I really liked that program and um, it really got into the cognitive psychology and that was, you know, that just sparked my interest so much. So it was, it was fun. It was good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where did you go from Austin? Well, then I started working in the field, uh, moved closer to family up North again. And um it wasn't too long, maybe after five years or so, I just went out on my own. I wasn't really cut out to do the the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, shift gears here slightly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to what I'm calling human performance technology, HPT, otherwise known as human performance improvement, HPI? or evidence-based practices for performance improvement or learning and development or training and development or instruction. 
again, we've got a lot of uh, various terms here that kind of- So many terms. Well, it was really in graduate school, you know, when I finally found out, oh, this is a field, it's a body of knowledge. Um, I remember waiting three semesters to learn how to storyboard, you know, and then it was kind of anticlimactic. Um, but it was that cognitive psychology that, you know, how do people learn? And I know that's just one way of looking at it. Um, and back then, I don't know if we thought about performance as much. Uh, that seemed to be something that came along for in my universe later on. Um, I was kind of geared towards uh, learning disabilities, and but I never did find uh, work in that field. So I ended up doing adult learning and was pretty happy there. Mm -hmm. So can you share for us some of your early influences, uh, people, books, articles, and things like that? Later on, we'll talk about people who are more recent, perhaps, mm -hmm. who would point others to. But for our audience, who were some of the earliest influences or what uh, were your earliest influences? Well, these were all from my professors. It was Gagne and Dick and Carey and... Um, all the people from that world, uh, a lot of, uh, I was interested when I had to do research, uh, in addition to learning disabilities, I was interested in, you know, the aesthetics, how the visual design of messaging and information architecture affects how people learn. Um, and that came from my art background. I just was really interested in, um, the visual design. Of, of, of these uh, approaches to learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that uh, you post quite a bit on your uh, blog and on social media about uh, uh, visual design and information architecture and things like that. And I very much appreciate it. I think that's, uh, you know, people, so many people come into the field uh, uh, in a non-traditional way and they need that kind of uh, uh, insight and guidance. Thank you. Um, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you do so we can provide an example to our audience, what would it be? At this point in my career, I help people learn, build, and grow their instructional design skills, or you could even call it um, understanding how to help people improve performance at work skills. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been spending my time doing and learning a lot. I learn, I learn a lot from beginners and I learn a lot from advanced people. So it's never ending. Well, tell us a little bit about, about your business here. So what, what sp specific kinds of products and services do you render to the marketplace and, and uh, why would our, and how would our audience uh, uh, follow up with you to, uh, to get what you're providing? Well, about three, I thought about this for five or six years. It took a few years to pull it together on the side. And uh, about three years ago, we opened, it's called masteringid.com. It's called Mastering Instructional Design, but that's the URL. And people join and I give classes and there are some self-paced courses and we have community calls and guest speakers and um, it's just kind of all things instructional design. I, uh, I've i noticed, I mean, I read about it, but until I experienced it, I didn't know how powerful it was to learn with a group. And it appears to accelerate people's learning. And what people have told me, uh, because people at all stages join, even people with PhDs in the field, which kind of shocked me. Um, <laughs> But uh, what people have told me is that when they hear what someone experienced says and what someone experienced is going through, it really helps them learn. And I love not being the only one that people rely on, you know, because I, all I can have is one experience. So by hearing from multiple people and just even hearing the questions from beginners, uh, we just all learn so much. So it's just been a great learning experience for all of us, including myself. Well, very cool. I will be sure to put the in the show notes on the YouTube nice. video the URL so that people can follow up even more and uh, hopefully join in. Thank you. 
Uh, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us anything in particular that you might be focused on? And are you doing any writing about that? Hmm. A lot of times I'm influenced by what people don't understand in the community or perhaps questions that they have. Most recently, I mean, this sounds so obvious, but when you look into it more deeply, um, it's not. Uh, like I'm currently writing an article on what a what an instructional practice is because I noticed a lot of people were were misunderstanding that because they the um the concept that all you that you need x number of hours to improve at something but yet without any feedback it's pretty not necessarily going to be anything that happens quickly so I just started looking at the research I have access to all the um, journals and I've just been looking at the research on how people are defining practice and what a practice consists of so those are the kinds of things that I research and write about on the e-learning coach website I'm not writing any books uh, right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I'll begin uh, again. I'll put in the URL for your uh, your blog so people can follow up with you. But uh, is there any tidbit of, of advice regarding practice that you could share with us right now? Well, I mean, I think uh, Patty Shank covers a lot of this in her book, Practice and Feedback. Um you know, it has to be deliberate. It has to be at the next level, you know, outside of people's abilities. It has to have feedback. Those are all the kinds of things I'm exploring and just trying to see if there are any subtle nuances in the research that I can add and expand to our body of knowledge. I, I enjoy re, uh, reinterpreting or interpreting the research so that Everyone doesn't have to go through those journal articles, which I enjoy. <laughs> and you are one of the unique ones, I think, that uh, enjoy going through those research articles. But uh, but thank you for doing that, uh, that translation from uh, research to practice. I think that's a very valuable need across the community. Thank you. My my next question is about our language. Uh, and is, is there a performance improvement or learning and development term or phrase that you would define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you just want to put your spin on it mm. for us? You know, the only thing I can really think of is something that many people aren't really talking about, which is visual design. And people will often ask me, why isn't it called graphic design? And uh, so how about that? Sure. The reason I chose the term visual design is because graphic designers often work, and I've taken graphic design courses, and they often work on advertising and marketing, and their goal of recognition and possibly remembering or just awareness is kind of is quite different than the goal of helping people to uh, learn, understand, and transfer that and apply it to the real world. So I feel that because our goals are somewhat different, we needed another term and because we're not focused on advertising. I mean, a lot of the foundational principles are the same, but when you have a different goal, you know, we can't be that clever, essentially. We have to be pretty simple. So how would you then define visual design for, for our audience? That's a really good question. I think I would say it's the, can I use the word visual in the um, definition? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we'll be kind of loose here. It's, it's all of the visual features of any products, uh, depending on what you're designing and developing, that you are creating, but also the aesthetic appeal of it. So there's there's a few levels of it. So it can be user interface, it can be pictures and images, it can be your video, it can be animation, and it can be the overall look and feel. Um, but we do get, and the typefaces that you choose, but we do get an aesthetic sense of something. And when it's beautiful, um, People believe it, they find it easier, and they 
could you research on that? And and um, they enjoy it more. It's motivating. Thank you for that. Yes. Now, let me shift gears again here slightly uh, to a follow-up to the earlier question. You mentioned Patty Shank. But who are some of the people that uh, you feel you would point our audience to uh, for some of their contributions to the field? And, and you know, feel free to call out, you know, uh, other people that have influenced you that may not be uh, as well known as a Patty Chang. Well, the people I'm thinking about are fairly well known, but I really do learn from everyone all day. Every time I'm reading something, I'm learning or reading my Twitter feed, I'm learning. Uh, well, there's you, and there's Patty, and there's Will Tallheimer and Miriam Nealon and Julie Dirksen, and I know I'm forgetting lots of others, Jane Bozarth. There are just so many wonderful people in the field um, who we can all learn from. And there's also you know, people who aren't well-known, people in user interface design, the Nielsen Norman group, I read a lot of their stuff people in visual design or graphic design. So uh, one of the things I love is just how multidimensional uh, our field is and multidisciplinary. And if one day I feel like reading about writing, then I'm going to do that, you know? So it's it's almost infinite. So besides the journals that you mentioned earlier, what, what are some of your sources? Are you into any particular social media uh, venues that uh, in particular? I tend to like Twitter. Uh, it turn, it seems, you know, I've, I've heard people criticize it, but my feed seems to be filled with helpful conversations and links to articles. I mean, of course, I can only slightly, you know, get to a very small portion of them. Um, I like Twitter and a little bit of Facebook. I have a Facebook group for instructional design newbies, and we have some interesting conversations there. Um, LinkedIn, I know, has a lot. I just haven't felt as a, I don't resonate with it as much, but I keep trying. Yeah, it seems that uh, people either like Twitter and not so much on, on LinkedIn or vice versa. And, uh, um, I, you know, they are different in terms of, you know, the because of the character count limitations on Twitter, mm. more brief, uh, succinct, concise kinds of <laughs> uh, uh, flashes of insight, I guess, versus uh, LinkedIn, which can go on much longer. But but uh, but thank you for sharing that with us. My uh, my final question to you is. Uh, for people generally newer to the profession. And so uh, what I'm looking for here is any words of wisdom or guidance that you might provide them as they enter the field. Mm. It's somewhat what I've already said, which is learn from many different fields because that inspires creativity. And it gives you a perspective that's outside of um, what we normally hear and think and read about. Sometimes I almost get a little tired of reading or hearing about <laughs> my field and it's a joy to go somewhere else. And since it involves so much writing, cognitive psychology or whatever learning theory uh, you believe in that week, um, you know, read all of that and I think you'll do better. A lot of times I'm counseling people on careers and they'll often come from video or come from professional writing. And I say, you know, highlight that on your resume, highlight that you're a graphic designer. We need people who have a real specialty like that. So if you come from a related field, um, I think it's great. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, uh, announced your ability to contribute in a particular yeah. specialty area. I think that's very important. Well, well, Connie, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. And uh, uh, I wish you well, and uh, I'll provide all the links to uh, your various sites in the show notes. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Guy. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.